On the west coast of Africa, in cities like Dakar, Senegal, people who live at or near the water's edge believe the negative effects of climate change are plain to see. Torrential rains and floods that seem beyond the ebb and flow of normal weather have been blamed on global warming. Some here are convinced a climate emergency has already begun. No event can be blamed on climate change, no single event, but when you are a humanitarian organization and you see that in Malawi, in Senegal, in Fiji, in Peru, all over the world we're seeing all these bizarre things happening that kill people, that make people suffer. If you ask the relatives and the friends of those who died, they're going to say, it's already happened. Now the question is, do we do this geoengineering thing? It's very scary. Geoengineering of a kind has already been tried in Senegal with tragic consequences. 320 kilometers north of Dakar, where the Senegal River flows into the Atlantic near the town of Saint Louis. Over the past several years, people living in the capital of what used to be a French colony, this normally quiet and reasonably prosperous city, had noticed ominous changes in the weather. There are really only two seasons here, hot, humid and rainy for five months, warm and dry with dust storms the rest of the year. In fact, the Sahara Desert lies just beyond the northeastern horizon. But over the last decade, abnormal amounts of rainfall had begun to raise the level of the river. People here were sure global warming was to blame. And because the heart of the city was built on a small island in midstream, local officials worried that monsoon flooding and rising sea levels would soon cause widespread damage and destruction. So in 2004, they came up with a drastic solution to the problem, a low-tech form of geoengineering. From Saint Louis, the Senegal River flows south another 25 kilometers, almost like a canal, hemmed in against the African coast by a long, narrow sand spit called the Langue de Barbarie. The big idea was to slice a hole through the sand spit and drain some of the river flood out to sea just a little quicker. And it did. It reduced the peak flood. But in the process, they really, really ruined someone else. After they cut an opening through the sandbar, the river water did indeed pour out to sea faster. But very quickly, the outrushing flood and the incoming tides chewed away the sand, making the gap wider and wider exposing the small village of Dun Babadia to the full fury of the open sea. What was once a secure and safe little hamlet started getting hammered by high tides, stronger winds, and vicious winter storms from the Atlantic. It was only a matter of time before disaster struck. Pablo Suarez was part of the disaster relief team that responded to the trouble in Dun Babadia and he felt it was his duty to come back to the village and explain how the good intentions of officials upstream in Saint Louis had gone horribly wrong. Et toi, eh, poster, eh, map. Suarez brought a set of posters showing satellite images of the sandbar and village before and after the drainage canal was cut. We can see in 2003, there is a very clear, solid and healthy sandbar. In 2004, a few months after the opening, the breche as they call it, we can see that what used to be a little canal of just a few meters wide has become several hundred meters wide. And by 2009, the opening has become just massive. It's almost two kilometers wide and it's just across from the village. Then, a brutal winter storm tossed giant waves against the coast of Senegal. Waves that would have been absorbed by the sandbar, the sandbar that had been cut open by geoengineers. Mangrove trees that once protected the village were torn out by the roots as homes were smashed. And on that night, there were people killed. We saw the destruction of those homes made of brick. The roofs fell, the, the walls fell. It takes a lot of force to bring down a house. The sea did that because the natural protection was no longer there. 
Ndumbe Dia survived the storm that wrecked her home, but lost five members of her family, including several children. Four families lived in this house, but now, with no safe place to rebuild, they don't know what to do. The intrusion of seawater has salted up the soil, so they can no longer grow enough food here to survive. Their drinking water has turned brackish, too. People here know they will soon become environmental refugees. For now, they survive, innocent victims of someone else's attempt to cope with a changing climate. Evidently, officials here did not have the money or the expertise to install a high-tech flood control system like the Dutch, the English, or the Italians might have done. Back at City Hall in Saint Louis, the mayor now agrees that cutting that gap in the sandbar was a mistake, but says they were overwhelmed and felt they had to do something. C'est un problème qui nous dépasse. C'est un problème lié à la gestion de la planète Terre, et je voudrais que toute la communauté internationale le sente ainsi. Voici des gens qui n'ont rien fait pour que la planète Terre soit polluée, des gens qui n'ont rien fait pour que l'effet de serre s'accentue, et des gens qui payent des conséquences extrêmement graves et dommageables pour des torts que d'autres ont commis. The biggest lesson from Dumba Badia is that when we make a decision in a rush and without knowing exactly what will happen, someone else will suffer. That's enormously unfair. I don't know what will happen with our planet. What happened to a small village in Senegal could happen to the entire planet if some nation decides to tweak the system in order to save itself from the effects of climate change. Flash forward 25 or 30 years, huge slabs of polar ice are dropping into the ocean, causing sea level to rise at a frightening pace. Wealthy nations have the technical expertise to defend themselves, at least for a while. So they're not quite ready to re-engineer the climate. But as global warming takes that rising sea and boils it up into humongous killer storms, poor nations, where millions of people live right at sea level or on river flood plains, are forced to react as their citizens become environmental refugees. The scary prospect of geoengineering looks more reasonable to a country that's trying to defend itself against a hostile environment. Just pick a day two decades from now and imagine what could happen. Hypothetically, a flood-ravaged country like Bangladesh might be among the first to take action, according to journalist and historian Gwyn Dyer. Here is Bangladesh. It's 25 years down the road. It's probably got 200 million people by now. They're in an area smaller than England, and they are up to their knees in water from rising sea level. And meanwhile, the rivers have dried up because the glaciers are gone up in the Himalayas. No food, floods, land disappearing. They stand to lose about 20% of their national area. At this point, I would think that Bangladesh would not be very concerned about the opinion of other countries. We want to turn the heat down now. We're going to do the geoengineering, and they can't. So Bangladesh launches its own climate modification campaign. Their plan is to hoist sulfuric acid into the stratosphere using high-altitude balloons. Cheap, easy, and unpredictable. What do we do next? Do we threaten them? Do we threaten them with nuclear weapons? If we do, who can they turn to? I would say they'd probably turn to China, which is going to be pretty desperate itself on that front and would love to have somebody get out and intervene in the climate, but not take the full responsibility itself. In this scenario, the United States and several European military powers threaten to intervene. Then China comes to the defense of Bangladesh, so there's a temporary stalemate. Spraying sulfuric acid across the sky creates a global sunscreen, which does delay for a while the worst effects of global warming. But just like cutting that hole through the sandbar in Senegal, turning down the global thermostat has unintended consequences. And yes, it does keep the temperature under two, but it changes the rainfall patterns, and the monsoon doesn't come. So there's a famine. 
Farmers in India and Pakistan share water from the Indus River system, which is drying up. India controls how much water crosses the border. Well, the Pakistanis are starving. And they start to threaten the Indians. And the Indians push back. And we're not talking about some piddling little border issue. We're talking about starvation here. Both of these countries have got nuclear weapons. I can get you a war out of that, like that. About a dozen retired three and four star admirals and generals came out with a report in 2007 that was titled Climate Change and the Threat to National Security. Pretty strong implication that it wasn't just a debate among environmentalists and big business or climate scientists. It was rather truly a national security issue that we need. Dennis McGinn, a retired US Navy admiral, confirms that climate change scenarios have become an important aspect of military strategic planning. We, from a national security military perspective, viewed the effects of climate change as acting as a threat multiplier for instability in key regions of the world. People will fight amongst families, amongst clans, amongst races, amongst countries, amongst religions. We're not a cooperative species by and large, and we've never been in a situation where we've had to act as a single global entity to save our own skins. Saving planet Earth from the effects of global warming may not be impossible. There are a few optimists left who think we can rehabilitate the climate. But there's one fundamental problem we would still have to solve, breaking the addiction that caused this problem in the first place.